I have a grandson who wants to be an astronaut. He's nearly 16, wanted to for 10 years. His aim is to go to Mars. Is he likely to do it in his lifetime? <laughs> um, yeah, career advice for astronauts is uh, <laughs> a tricky one. Um, I think there are a few things to consider. First of all, is there any chance that we could get humans to Mars within the next, I don't know, 50 years? I think the answer is probably yes. It seems like it's not beyond our, the, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge, but it's not technologically unthinkable that we could get humans to Mars. Um, is it going to happen in practice? Well, that very much depends on politics and on, you know, sustained funding into uh, uh, crude space travel. And who in the world is really likely to put that level of money in that will actually get them there? Well, maybe the Chinese uh, are probably the most likely people. Um, I, th I think the chances of us doing it in the UK, I hesitate to say this, <laughs> but at the moment we don't seem to have a very long horizon for the decisions <laughs> that, that get taken. So. <laughs> my, my, be, my, my advice to him would be go and learn Mandarin. <laughs> uh, Lizzie, there's a question there. Bearing in mind the uh, finite speed of light, how do you, would we reconcile the inflation of the Big Bang? So that the inflation took place and the universe expanded, but light hasn't caught up with it. If nothing can go faster than light, how does inflation go faster mm -hmm. than light? I know it sounds a real question, but... It's something that I can't get my head around. Yeah, so, so just to fill in for people who haven't come across inflation, because I didn't mention it explicitly, they're, they're, part of the answer to the question I posed towards the end about where did those ripples come from um, is something called inflation, and it's a hy hypothetical stretching of space that takes place very early in the history of the universe, in the first tiny fraction of a second. And one of the things it's supposed to do is make space large enough that essentially it, it sort of outstrips the uh, speed of light itself. And the question is, well, how, how is that possible? That this, supposedly, the speed of light is an absolute limit. And the answer, actually, is that within general relativity, uh, the, the speed of light is not quite the absolute limit that you might imagine. So on, on the one hand, Einstein's special relativity uh, introduced the idea that the speed of light is some absolute speed limit for the universe. But on the other hand, in general relativity, that idea is slightly refined. And what it says in general relativity is that nothing can overtake something else at more than the speed of light. So it, it's about whether you know, I can rush past you at more than the speed of light. And I can't do that. That's what relativity says. But what relativity doesn't prevent is for the distance between two widely separated things in space to be expanding at more than what you would think of as the speed of light. And essentially, the way that's all reconciled is a quite complicated mathematical framework of curved space-time. Um, but ultimately, I think the best way to think about it is that the speed of light limit is only something that applies to overtaking rather than rushing away. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's a sort of, uh, well, if you say so, uh, <laughs> gesture. There's a question just at the front there. <laughs> in the other stars in the universe, do we know if it's the same physics and chemistry going on as in our sun? for them to produce the light. And that must mean, if it is the same, they've got all the same elements there. Yes. So, I mean, it, this is a question that there's a lot of research into. You know, how, how similar are the uh, basic physical makeup of, of widely separated parts of our universe? First of all, as far as we can tell, the stars do seem to obey exactly the same physics as our own sun and, and as we do here on Earth. As far as we can tell, despite a lot of effort, there's no difference in the laws of physics from one part of the universe to another. Um, and so you're absolutely right to say, as a, 
as a follow-on from that, that the elements that are present in distant stars and even in distant galaxies are very, very similar, uh, if not identical, to the elements that we're made out of. And in fact, we can find evidence for that. So if you split, if you take the, the light from distant stars and split it into its different colours, or in other words, take a spectrum of that light, then you see telltale hints of different elements, and they do correspond exactly to the elements that, that we know and love from uh, uh, the sun and from our own planets. Good question. Thank you. There's a gentleman up there. Hi. Can you say something about the expansion of the universe? Will it continue, or is there going to be a big crunch in a few quintillion years? Um, yeah, I, one of the big questions maybe, what, 20, 20 years ago was what's the fate of the universe? And it seemed like there were two options, as you say. Either the universe sort of coasts on forever or uh, perhaps gravity is strong enough. And it's just a pure effect of gravity that there's a possibility that the gravitational tug of everything pulling on everything else will eventually uh, crunch the universe back together in the big crunch. Um, that was pretty much put to rest in the 1990s where people measured the expansion of the universe using the Hubble Space Telescope actually um, uh, sort of accurately enough for the first time to see not just how fast is it expanding now but how fast was it expanding in the past and when you put all of that evidence together you find that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating so, so not only is the universe expanding, but it's doing so at an ever-increasing rate, as far as we can tell. Now, this is a deeply mysterious thing. We don't fully understand it. We have some ideas about what might be going on, but we don't fully understand what it all means. But if you take the simplest possible explanation for what's going on, then it would suggest that that acceleration will just continue. So the universe will continue to expand. It'll continue to expand ever faster and faster. Uh, and if that sounds like good news, because at least we're not all going to be crunched back together, it's not really particularly good news uh, because as everything gets further and further apart, it gets harder and harder to find sources of energy. Uh, and so uh, the, the long-term future of life is very much in doubt. Uh, but I would address the oceans thing first. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to know how black holes come into all this because you talk about everything expanding, but isn't that a case where everything's contracting? Yeah, so black, black holes are these regions in the universe where so much stuff has been crammed into such a small space that gravity has gone a bit mad uh, and, and nothing can get out, just as I can't sort of jump off the Earth's surface. In, in a black hole, the power of gravity is, is so intense that not even light can actually get away from it. Um, and originally they were thought to be mathematical curiosities. They wouldn't ever exist in the real universe. But actually now we have excellent evidence that they are out there. And they probably come about from sort of natural extension of the thing that I was talking about, where if you, you know, gather a little bit of stuff together, it has a gravitational pull, uh, so it gathers more and more and more stuff. And so if you allow that process to run away for long enough in a small enough region of space, you will eventually form a black hole. And in fact, some of Stephen Hawking's early work was showing how, it, how it's actually inevitable that if you let this process continue running, you will form black holes. So um, black holes very naturally form as part of this whole story of structure forming in our universe. But it doesn't mean that everything has to end up in a black hole. Luckily, you can get to stable points, like, for instance, our own solar system, where, at least as far as we can tell, everything's sort of orbiting around the sun quite happily. There's no reason to think it would suddenly sort of plunge into the sun, and the sun would suddenly become some kind of monster that would, uh, you know, suck in enough stuff until it can create a black hole. You can create black holes out of stars, but uh, it's not something that's going to happen to our own sun. So it happens in some places and not others. Good question. Ooh, more questions, uh, spring, hands springing up. Uh, Lisa, do you have the lady there in the blue? I just wanted to know where all the energy came from in the first instance to create the Big Bang. Ah. <laughs> So, so now you're, you're, you're going, you know, for, there, are always, there are always more questions, which is one of the things that is so beautiful about cosmology. I'll never be out of a job. <laughs> uh, the, 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 because you're going even one stage further, I suppose, and saying, well, where the ripples come from? Why is there... It really, I think, what you're saying, why is there something rather than nothing? You know, why, why, where did all of the material come from? 
Einstein said E equals mc squared. So whether you're talking about the material, which is mass, m, or the energy, E, it's sort of immaterial. You know, it really comes down to this question of why is there something rather than nothing? I think the honest answer to that question is nobody knows. Um, there are, of course, many different thoughts about it. And one of the intriguing ideas is that our universe may have been born out of something even larger still that we call the multiverse, just to uh, make things sound even more mysterious. Um, and the multiverse uh, could be some kind of construction that's somehow been around for eternity. And so that kind of then delays the question. You say, well, <laughs> let's just... Let's just sweep this under the carpet because we have this giant multiverse that can, can create universes within it and then uh, we can talk about the multiverse for a while and then not have to tackle the question of where did the multiverse come from. <laughs> Will there ever be an answer to questions like that? I'm not entirely sure. It's very hard to imagine what would a really satisfying answer even look like. Very uh, mind-blowing question. Uh, <laughs> some people in the front row here, Lisa, if you can uh, get a microphone with them. Lizzie, have you got anyone at the back as well? Anyone up there? Anyone upstairs as well? Oh, there's a question upstairs, if you can go there next. This lady at the front. Um, after hearing about what we're doing to the ocean, <laughs> are we getting a bit worried about all the junk we're chucking out into space? Or is that all so close to us that we needn't worry about it yet? Uh, junk in space is a big problem, actually. Um, uh, so, you know, space, space is really large. So, in <laughs> principle, it would be a great place to get rid of all the plastic. <laughs> you know, you just launch it all into space. As long as it's a sufficiently distant part of space, uh, not to mention the rocket fuel. You'd, now, I haven't really thought this through, have I? <laughs> but anyway, the, the problem with junk in space is actually that it's all pretty close to us, that we've launched an awful lot of stuff into low Earth orbit, an awful lot of satellites, more and more every year. Um, you know, it's now commercially viable to launch satellites, so individual corporations can launch their own satellites. Um, and there is so much stuff up there that uh, it's probably just a matter of time until a huge problematic accident takes place. Uh, if you saw that film with Sandra Bullock, uh, which is the name, Gravity, mm -hmm. it's a film called Gravity, where essentially there's a sort of a, a cascade of disasters in, in low Earth orbit, because one bit of junk rams into a space station, uh, that destroys the space station, the space station generates lots more junk, all of that junk goes off and rams into other uh, things. It, that basic idea is something that really does worry engineers working on, on near-Earth space. Uh, it may just be a matter of time until it happens, which could be pretty catastrophic, actually, for us here on Earth. So there's definitely a, a, a big problem there. Um, exactly what we do about it is not entirely clear, but people are trying to develop sort of robotic things that will actually be able to remove junk from low Earth orbit. Whether we'll do that in time is another question. So I think we've probably got time for two more questions, one up in the gallery and then a question down here as well. Um, in the video where you were looking at the formation of the galaxies, it often seemed to involve spirals. Is, is the spiral the natural shape of a galaxy, and if so, why? Yeah, the, so a spiral is certainly a natural shape for a galaxy. It's not the only natural shape for a galaxy. Um, but it's the, the reason that spirals are fairly natural is because you're forming it from lots of material, lots of gas and dust that, that, that's flowing in from large scales. And it's flowing actually down the filaments that I showed you. So I showed you this sort of cosmic web. In fact, you can see it on the screen right now. So there's this cosmic web, and then the individual galaxies are being fed by material that's actually more or less flowing along the filaments that you're looking at. And so it arrives into a galaxy with, with some, you know, from some, uh, it's almost like a sort of hose. And then when it reaches the center, the gravity is strong enough to trap it. But it quite naturally enters a sort of orbit bit around the center of the galaxy and that gives you a sort of disc-like galaxy uh, which can then also get spirals in it which is a kind of density wave it's almost like a sort of ripple on top of that basic uh, disc galaxy shape so that's why disc galaxies are quite common you do get galaxies of other shapes in particular you get elliptical galaxies which is probably coming about when you smash two existing spiral galaxies together, and so they lose that sense of which direction the disk is supposed to be in, and everything just gets a bit scrambled. But that 
that topic of what sets the shapes of galaxies and their sizes and their colours and so on is in fact still an area of a lot of active research. And the final question here. This might be related to what you've just answered, but if, they are, if the universe is expanding, accelerating, how come we expect, say, something like the Andromeda galaxy to crash into our own Milky Way? Yeah, for, first of all, just to say, yes, the Andromeda galaxy is thought to be on a collision course for our Milky Way. Uh, and, I, and so the question is then, how do you reconcile that? And it's a question of scale, actually, that the Andromeda galaxy is our nearest neighbour galaxy. And on a cosmological scale, it's almost on top of us already. Um, so, you know, it's just a few short billion years until it, mm -hmm. it arrives, um, which yeah, really is really not that long in cosmological um, timescales. Um, whereas when we talk about the accelerated expansion or even just the expansion of the universe, we're looking to galaxies which are much more distant. Remember, there are these hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. So if you just focus on our nearest one, then you will see, and it's a continuation of the process of building bigger and bigger galaxies that I was talking about. It's just an, a continuation of that. But that's only really going on on small scales now. And if you go out to large scales, you see that the overall pattern on large scales is of stuff flying apart ever faster. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much, Andrew, for a fascinating talk. Thank you.